Welcome to the Multnomah Group's regular webinar series. Today's topic, the impact of Department of Labor guidance on target date funds. My name is Eric Daly. I'm managing principal of the Multnomah Group. And today's presentation, we intend to cover some important guidance provided by the Department of Labor related to uh, target date investments. Uh, this guidance came out in uh, February of 2013 and was published under the title Target Date Retirement Funds, Tips for ERISA Plan Fiduciaries. So today we'll talk specifically about the Department of Labor guidance uh, and obviously its impact under the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, at least as a safe harbor uh, that should be relevant to those plans that may not uh, be subject to the employee Retirement Income Security Act, uh, but utilize it as best practice in managing their own uh, fiduciary governance practices. And the guidance provided under the Tips for ERISA Plan Fiduciaries, the Department of Labor laid out eight uh, fundamental requirements or guidelines for plan sponsors uh, as it pertains to their target date investments. And, and the first, uh, establishing a process for comparing and selecting target date funds. Much has been written about how difficult that is. Uh, difficulty notwithstanding, the Department of Labor certainly has an expectation uh, that plan sponsors have a thorough process for uh, comparing and selecting target date funds that they may use in a retirement plan. Second, establishing a process for the periodic review of selected target dates. Target dates are fundamentally different from most other types of investments contained in defined contribution plans. Uh, as a result, many plan sponsors have struggled to utilize the same types of methodologies that they may use for large growth, large blend, small cap value, and bond products, and analyzing the performance and suitability of uh, target date investments in the plan. Clear standing the plan's investments and the way they allocate to different asset classes and how those allocations change over time. Uh, and then viewing the funds, fees, and investment expenses. This is very similar to guidance that the Department of Labor has been regularly providing plan sponsors about the need uh, to manage effectively the cost of being a retirement plan participant. Uh, some of the guidance has to come around the topic of inquire about whether custom or non-proprietary target date funds would be better for your plan, and we'll get into that in greater detail. Effective employee communications, the, taking advantage of the available resources and information to help you evaluate target date recommendations you may receive, and then also analyzing those target date products going forward. And then always is important as it pertains to employee, plans governed by the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, how you document that process. That's why this guidance has become necessary. Been a huge uptick in the utilization of target date funds inside defined contribution retirement plans. Uh, the first project was launched back in 1994, and it certainly at the end of 2003, there were only 16 of these funds, so a mere 10 years ago. Now they're well over 30, uh, and provided a list of some of the largest of the target date funds based on the Morningstar Fund survey from May 2012. There are hundreds of billions of dollars now in the target date universe. Uh, and Pins and Investments recently opined that by the year 2025, they predicted that as much as half of the contribution retirement assets may be invested in target date product. In a short period of time, we've seen the majority or will see the majority of assets and defined contributions cannibalized uh, on this uh, target date fund investment structure, if you were to believe the predictions that are out there currently. As a result, the decision about how to select and your methodology for selecting a target date fund becomes increasingly important. Uh, and we look at the selection criteria really as being one that's a four-tiered process. The first tier being uh, investment management firm's capabilities. The second, uh, does the equity glide path or glide path meet the needs of the participant population we have? Uh, the third, uh, do we utilize within that glide path, the types of asset classes and investment products that would be reasonable and appropriate for our participant population? And last, how effectively does the portfolio manager put together an investment structure that works 
for your participant population. And what is overlaid by that is the impact of costs on participant performance. Uh, while not included in any one aspect, cost is always an overriding concern when selecting any type of investment product, and certainly one that carries as much in assets as target dates likely will. Uh, over the course of the coming years, it becomes that much more important. So investment manager firm capabilities. Um, there is a fundamental change that occurs when participants begin using target dates investments. In addition to obviously their ease of use, we've also begun to notice huge changes in the types of participants that utilize target date funds. We seem to have increasing usage among millennials and younger participants who have an expectation that investment products and all user experiences have been customized to meet their specific needs. And as a result, we're seeing heavy utilization of younger, new participants in retirement plans. We've also begun to see an increasing utilization at the other end of the spectrum. Older participants who are nearing retirement, who are looking for an ease of use asset allocation product that gives them some level of equity exposure, hopefully an adequate and appropriate level of equity exposure uh, as they work through their final years of their working career. But in transition, the big change becomes that asset allocation is no longer the prior responsibility of the plan participant. It gets assumed by the fund manager through the target date process. And that security section is also no longer the responsibility of the plan participant, but is therefore delegated to the target date fund manager. As a result, the transitioning of this responsibility to the fund manager, I think, puts in high level of onus and on plan sponsors to evaluate and gain a deeper understanding of the investment management firm to whom they're making those dele delegations. Their study, their experience, their commitment, people, process, and resources, all of which I'll talk about in greater detail. Let's start with the firm evaluation. And so on the uh, in product side, uh, when making decisions and reviewing the appropriateness of target date investments, how is the firm evaluation criteria conducted? And, and always underlying evaluating investment management firms is how stable is the organization. When using target date funds, you're expecting participant utilization to be over the course of a participant's lifetime in that particular investment product. And depending on your own stability of your workforce, it's not uncommon to see people using these investment products for 10, 15, 30 years. As a result, you want to be able to have a target date investment manager who ultimately will be stable and consistent over the course of your utilization. While we continue to see uh, it, plan sponsors swap out ec products, fixed income products periodically, uh, the early data on target date funds is the rate of replacement of one target date set for another is much lower than in other asset classes. Stability becomes that much more important in finding a partner that you can have for a number of years. What experience does the firm have in creating global asset allocation portfolios? Many mutual fund companies uh, have been born out of the need to create a very specific investment mandate. Peak investment managers who've created large cap growth strategies, value strategies, real estate strategies which may make them the perfect or most appropriate choice to putting together a global asset allocation portfolio because it's outside the bounds of their experience and background. Ultimately, doing that, uh, the types of things that we would traditionally look for are outsource pension investing experience. So on the defined benefit side, kind of pre-transition or the massive transition to defined contribution, uh, level of exposure did they have to managing large pension portfolios. Did investment consulting piece of their business? Did they, prior to launching target date funds, perhaps have target risk type investment strategies? Do they manage the asset allocation work internally, or do they outsource that to a third party? In looking at the commitment of the investment manager to the target date space, we went a rapid period of expansion from 2003 to 2013 specifically in the 2003 to 2008 period, 
We're a lot of smaller investment managers launching target date products to try and capitalize on the right growth of utilization in that segment. Um, ultimately, uh, one of the challenges that target date investment managers have is that getting significant contributions within their target date set tends to be contingent upon their ability to be actively available on adequate record-keeping platforms and be able to compete competitively with larger brand names. So certainly an understanding that the firm you're partnering with is kid over the long term to target date investing and have, again, that suitability of a longer term investment portfolio and strategy. As with all investment management firms, looking at the people and the process of target date funds becomes critical. The change, however, on the process side is do they have processes for evaluating changes to their own target date funds? We've experienced over the course, really, of the last three years, some of the largest target date investment managers in the country making significant changes to the glide path, asset allocation within their target date set. And coming upon plan sponsors and fiduciaries to have a good understanding of what that process is and what their beliefs are as it relates to making prospective changes to the underlying, uh, the underlying engine that drives target date fund performance. What gets talked significantly by the Department of Labor and certainly by FINRA as it relates to target date funds um, is the reality that target date funds, while they may have very similar names, take very different approaches uh, to allocating assets within portfolios. And for plan sponsors, then it becomes important for you and the fiduciaries with whom you work to come together to identify uh, an equity glide path, an overall glide path that makes sense for your participant population. And path for those who may not be aware is that transition from in early working years, high equity portfolios, low bond exposure, to over the course of a working career, a portfolio that has less equity exposure and increased bond exposure. And so equity glide path becomes critical in determining the success of participants in any given short term period of time. But in the long run, the plan considerations have to do with the employee demographic. Ultimately, when trying to match glide paths to population, what you're looking at is average income levels, uh, future expectations about wage growth, the turnover of your employee population, uh, the existing asset allocation of participants uh, in your plan pre-exposure to target dates, and financial literacy of the population you're seeking to provide benefits to. How your plan is designed also should contribute to the type of equity glide path selection. Do you have a benefit structure to complement your defined contribution? Are you using auto enrollment, auto escalation, and other features to drive higher levels of savings and contribution rates? What are employer contribution levels and what percentage of the population is adequately covered by the employer contribution? if they're grant profit sharing in nature. And then do you use employer stock as a portion of your benefit? And then serve fiduciary considerations. The level and depth of your investment mandate is going to be driven by the knowledge of the plan fiduciaries and the analytic process and how comfortable they are taking additional risk, be that through increased equity exposure or through utilizing other less common investment sleeves within the target date glide path. Then the fund considerations in managing glide path. Do you look have an investment target set which uses a to retirement versus a through retirement? So you have some target date theses which say we want to run you to a terminal or lowest asset allocation at age 65 and maintain the same equity exposure from 65 through the end of your life. As other investment managers have a declining equity risk exposure past age 65, assuming that participants will want to assume even less equity exposure at age 70, 75, 80, 85, and beyond. Getting equity level perspective, how much uh, equity exposure is enough equity exposure? What's the slope of the glide path transition from high equity to low equity? And 
what's the terminal equity date? Is it age 65, as you see in most two retirement products, or in some cases it can go as long as age 90, that would see continuing declines until you hit a, an advanced age. And those differences are tremendous. When you take a look at the target date equity glide path exposure, um, and we took the largest in this case, 15 investment uh, target products and compared their equity glide path exposure. And for the overwhelming majority, as you're 45 years from retirement date, you're looking at equity glide path exposure that's somewhere between 80 and 99 percent of total portfolio exposure with a few outliers, where you see the broadest disagreement uh, about the appropriate level of equity risk, really that 10-year to retirement to 10 years past retirement, where you can see equity glide path exposure that may be in some cases as much as three to four times highest to lowest uh, as far as most aggressive to least aggressive exposure. The impact of glide path performance, as I mentioned earlier, has a significant impact in the short term on performance. Clearly, glide path will have also long term exposure differences, but over massive market cycles and repetitive market cycles, those tend to balance out. However, in shorter periods of time, the differences can be dramatic. So, what we've done here is take what we consider kind of an aggressive glide path investment product like the one provided by T. Rowe Price and convert it to a conservative glide path product. And in this case, we use the Wells Fargo Dow Jones Target Retirement Funds. Uh, and then we took two calendar years where we experienced arguably the highest level or maybe inarguably highest levels uh, of uh, uh, divergence of performance returns, uh, 2008. Uh, where we saw a tremendous unraveling of the equity markets and the 2009 recovery that followed. So if we compare 2010 aggressive glide path fund, in this case, uh, hero price, to the 2010 conservative fund, Wells Fargo. So these participants arguably would be age 60 plus, uh, a year to two years, maybe three years from retirement. Uh, it's of the most aggressive Glide Path Fund, T. Rowe Price in 2008, it was down over 25% of accumulation. So someone in retire nearing retirement uh, experienced a decline of about 25% versus conservative approach, which was down a little more than 10. Uh, clearly a huge difference in performance. However, take a look at the 2009 recovery and the other side of that same coin. Uh, in 2010, or 2009, pardon me, the aggressive target date fund from T. Rowe Price up 28%. Uh, and correspondingly, the more conservative, directly more conservative Wells Fargo target date fund up only 12.76. That's not to say any one of those investment products was the right investment product to hold, but I do think that the Department of Labor and FINRA is excessively concerned that both A, you as plan sponsor and fiduciaries understand those differences, and then B, your plan participants are given adequate information so that they can make decisions and have an understanding of what the impact of equity market risk will have on their portfolio, especially as they near retirement. Because correspondingly, if you were to look at the 2050 portfolios, uh, despite the aggressive and conservative differences, because they're so heavily equity oriented, the differences in performance are almost nominal in comparison to the 2010 period. Looking at active versus passive investment management becomes a, uh, an important decision that plan sponsors make in selecting target date funds as part of their process. Active portfolios clearly seek to outperform a benchmark uh, and seek to allow you through a manager's skill and selecting securities. However, they do tend to be more expensive, therefore creating a higher hurdle for them to outperform their benchmark on a net of fee basis. Compared to passive, or what are some kind of called index funds, uh, seek to provide market levels of return and back benchmark indexes by rotating the underlying investment structure. Uh, the hurdle for them is much lower as costs uh, almost always uh, tend to be lower in the passive portfolios than in the active portfolios. And occasionally you'll see, although it tends to be rare, hybrid portfolios that have some elements 
uh, of active and passive understanding which elements of your uh, target allocation, your glide path, are active versus passive and where you should expect to get market-like performance. Those areas where you would expect to get performance in access of the market. Considerations, quickly on the active side, we get back to that people, process, philosophy, costs, and capacity issues to determining how successfully we would expect an active manager to be in, in, in comparison to their custom benchmark. Uh, and how do they go about the process of selecting the underlying managers that make up that asset allocation? And how do they deal with underlying performance that may not meet expectations? We have a target date fund that uses five, seven, ten different uh, building block pieces, fund of funds that ultimately make up the total portfolio. Uh, if you have underperformance in two, three, one of those uh, investment management sleeves or chunks, how do you go about making changes to that within the investment product structure? When looking at the environment, the issues tend to be related to glide path and then evaluating the impact of costs and based on investment strategy. Does the target date fund have access broad enough to provide the asset exposures that are desired? So when you underlying data about active and passive, um, like in any, uh, uh, many surveys, that is relatively inconclusive. So we rated uh, at the end of June 30th, 2013, the 32 largest uh, active and hybrid target date structures. So excluding all the passive sets, just the active 32. Uh, and then ran custom target date benefits or custom target date analysis on each of those sets based on their exposures over the past five years. So we aided the impact uh, essentially of differences in asset allocation in performance to try and evaluate how much excess return Excess return can be positive or negative, but how different was the actual return than the expected return based on the custom benchmark? Uh, and we found was of the 32, 15 target date sets had positive average alpha, meaning over the course of all of their target date funds on a basis, they did provide some outperformance to their benchmark index. High average alpha was nearly 2% annualized, and the list was down uh, well over 1% a year, less than you would have expected given their glide path. Average alpha was zero. Um, so over the course of five-year period, at least through June 30th, uh, what we experienced is a coin flip opportunity to try and outperform the broader market. However, where most of the outperformances come from has tended to be uh, on investment products that are more heavily bond exposure-oriented. So if you look at the graph on the right, retirement income products, which are the most conservative of the target date products, though the most likely to have experienced outperformance. And I think a huge piece of that has to do with the two implicit risks that have been talked about significantly in the target date universe. Uh, one of those is that there have been tremendous changes to the shape uh, of the yield curve and certainly managers' ability to be on the correct side of interest rate risk exposure has been important to performance. And the second is that when comparing benchmark indices, when you look at active target date products, they tend to use uh, more credit spread risk type investment strategies. And at least over this five year period, credit spread risk has paid a dividend in comparison to lower risk, more government oriented type bond exposures. On the other side, where you've been most likely to experience negative excess returns is my high equity uh, oriented, oriented products. So target dates 2051 and beyond uh, with an average negative alpha, so returns less than expected of well over 60 basis points. So moving on to one, I think underneath all of the work that needs to go into selecting a target date fund that certainly contributes to the knowledge set that you need to have to review those target date funds perspective. And on the biggest issue that we have to make as it relates to reviewing performance and target date funds, has anything in our initial analysis changed? 
and that could be the demographics of our organization have changed, the construct of our plan structure has changed, or certainly the more typical things that you would see in an investment universe, which is that there have been changes in investment management structure and product structure that might impact how we go about reviewing investment products. Second is the investment target date structures we've selected, are they consistently behaving in a manner as we would expect it given the market environment? I think it's back to the example of aggressive versus less aggressive target date funds. It would clearly have been a mistake to terminate an aggressive target date fund manager in 2008 uh, because equity markets had not performed well. You got the performance that you would have and should have expected to get given the risk exposure. Had terminated an aggressive manager in 2008, you would have missed out on the corresponding 2009 recovery. For active portfolios and even passive portfolios, are the portfolio managers adding value? And that can be kind of a two-tiered question. Uh, one is, is the portfolio performing better than we would have expected given its asset allocation and glide path? Second is, is using that target date structure helping participants who are less sophisticated achieve a better return than they would have given their ability to have a balanced asset allocated product versus requiring them to select their own investment allocation and products. And how do your products compare to the other alternatives? We're seeing innovations constantly in the target date fund universe, and how does your investment product compare to the other types of alternative investment structures that might be available to you. One that we do that is taking a look at what we call observed investment style. So based on your performance uh, as a target date manager, how do we isolate out the pieces of the portfolio that are generating the returns that participants seek? So this is an observed investment style analysis on a target date set that looks at each of the products from a 2050 to a retirement income and breaks it into its investment sleeves. So you can see the orange, for instance, is exposure equivalent to the Russell 3000 index. You can see in brown a small sleeve of real estate exposure. Clearly, in most cases, you're going to see the blue, which is an exposure to aggregate bonds, and to gray, which is the uh, international index. So understanding the differences in asset allocation and the transition as a worker ages is important. But what it allows you to do then is actual performance attribution, which is give those exposures, are our returns different than those you would expect to have received uh, in the marketplace as a whole? And in this, to make it easy to see, we've highlighted it in orange. So the orange lighting that our returns were either higher above the zero line than we would have expected, or lower, beneath the zero line, lower than we would have expected, asset allocation over this five-year period of time. Uh, and in this particular instance, in the averages that I showed you earlier, what we tend to see is excess performance, positive alpha on the bond-oriented exposures, and negative alpha on the equity-oriented exposures. It gives you opportunity to evaluate where we're doing better than we should have expected, and where we may have been doing less well than we would have expected. Much has been said and written about the notion that target date funds, if you compare 30 sets of 2020 funds, the returns will be very different, um, but expect them to be different because they've taken very different investment approaches to managing that risk. Um, so Using, utilizing the old moded way of saying, well, here's our benchmark for all 2020 funds uh, and comparing our performance to a, a benchmark that is probably arbitrary given our unique asset allocation. What we've recommended doing instead is looking at it on a volatility basis. So in this case, what we've done is highlighted a specific set of target date investments and compared them to the entire target date marketplace, which are the gray dots. What we're looking at is get a level of standard deviation as at least one measure of risk on the x-axis. Has our investment product outperformed uh, the majority of the gray dot peers? In this case, you see that on the more aggressive equity glide path pieces, 2040 and beyond, 
bond funds, that we've experienced performance that has been less than and, uh, we of our peers uh, have provided over that, that same period of time. On the more conservative allocations, however, you see where there's performance that is actually in excess of the majority of our peers. But what type of comparison also allows you to do very quickly, identify how aggressive your target date set is in comparison to your peer group as well. Uh, a target date set where had all of the colorful dots were shifted to the far right end of the distribution would clearly be a much more aggressive target date allocation. Uh, conversely, if this colorful dot set had been shifted to the far left-hand side of the distribution curve, uh, you'd be experiencing uh, a, a target date asset allocation strategy which was far more conservative uh, than many of your peers. And it provides, again, context to what's available in the marketplace as a whole. Moving on to number three from the Department of Labor uh, is understanding the funds investments. I think that, uh, unfortunately, because many committees and many fiduciaries have grown accustomed to the process of reviewing investment product uh, and manager of that product and not having a fundamental understanding of the underlying investments, that lack of knowledge gets extended and almost heightened in a target date investment where the products become vastly more sophisticated in their construct. Um, so in looking at target date funds, it's important to determine and for committees to understand which asset classes they feel comfortable having included in their target date asset allocation. So when global asset managers come through with the process of creating these glide paths, uh, what modeling and expected return phenomena do they come with to help them put together their mix of asset allocations over time? Uh, they use that based on historical returns data, or is it based on their forecasted return data going forward? Uh, an impact of fund managers' investment products play in determining asset classes. Clearly, uh, investment managers with a limited product set have less building blocks that they can utilize to populate their target date asset allocation structure. Uh, but at the time, there's been concerns about investment managers uh, using their target date funds as a way to help seed small investment products and help them grow by utilizing the flow that comes, the heavy inflows that traditionally come from target date investments. And then again, how frequently does the fund manager review that asset class structure? I think it's certainly not realistic to expect that a asset allocation and glide path could be fixed uh, for a period of 30 or 40 years, but I think it's also equally uh, realistic and, and perhaps unsettling to have asset allocations or glide paths uh, that change continuously. So get an issue of understanding what's in your target date investment product. We need to look at uh, the building blocks as falling into kind of three uh, primary pieces and then helping plan sponsors understand which of those pieces they feel comfortable having in a target date product, which certainly would have an impact on how they go through their selection and ongoing evaluation process. I think in every case, at least that I'm aware of, uh, target date products carry kind of the additional standard asset classes of some cash exposure for liquidity reasons, uh, some level of intermediate bond exposure, uh, large cap U.S. equities, small cap U.S. equities, and international equities. And at a very minimum, you would expect that that would give you some exposure to the marketplace in a broad way. Uh, we are seeing and see in many cases, in most cases, some level of portfolio diversifiers that are either designed to enhance return or reduce risk and moderate volatility. Uh, stable value is an alternative to cash. Uh, so being able to use a building block which doesn't didn't have the same uh, level of volatility as bonds, but might have a higher expected return in the current interest rate environment than cash is one way to do that. I've made already uh, the increasing use among target date funds of using credit spread products, in some cases all the high yield bond exposure, to try and generate excess return. Uh, seen a tremendous increase in the utilization of global bond products as alternative to straight domestic bond products as a way to increase returns and perhaps uh, reduce risk by increasing 
uh, or decreasing the uh, correlation rate between it and equities. Uh, cap international stocks and emerging market stocks uh, have uh, certainly increased uh, their hold inside target date investment products. And in some cases, volatility sleeves, where investment managers are given some discretion given on market environment to try and uh, either reduce volatility or increase volatility at a time where it would help participants. And then we've seen a huge increase in real return hedges. As the population ages, we have the well-documented aging of the baby boom population uh, and concerns about future inflation. It always seems to be future inflation that we're worried about because we haven't experienced much of it just yet, uh, is how do we uh, provide a hedge against reductions in purchasing power? So these real return hedges, we've seen huge uptick in the utilization of Treasury inflation protected securities. In many cases, at times, been inopportune given the returns of, of tips in the near term, but we've seen that as an increased strategy. Uh, increased utilization of commodities. Uh, within the portfolio, but again, like TIPS, uh, commodities at the time of addition in many of the portfolios has actually been a detractor to performance. Um, real estate, REITs are direct owned uh, in target date investment products, and then natural resource stocks, all of which designed to try and reduce correlation with your standard asset classes while simultaneously helping older participants hedge against potential inflation. And these in asset class inclusion becomes tremendously important in the actual return of a portfolio. Uh, so while we talk and what's about almost as is the level of equity glide path exposure or equity risk that a portfolio might have, um, that can kind of miss the actual point of risk uh, and return if you don't understand the underlying building block. So when we kind of go back to the investment apocalypse of 2008 to try and draw that comparison. But we took a 2010 product and compared it to a 2015 product to give you a feel of what the impacted difference could be. So the 2010 product from fund company A uh, had portfolio weightings uh, of uh, on the, uh, uh, on the uh, side, roughly 58% and 42% uh, allocated or to the, pardon me, 55% equ equity allocation, 45% bond allocation, versus the 2015, uh, which had a higher equity allocation, in this case about 62 and only 38% bond. But in the 2010 instance, instead of using more conservative government bonds and credit index type instruments, they had a 16% asset allocation to high yield bonds, which declined well over 25% in the 2008 return period. So despite the fact that the 2010 product had a much lower equity exposure, the reason that in 2008 had lost 6% more than the 2015 product that had a higher equity risk exposure. So understanding the underlying sleeves that make up your glide path can also be uh, very troubling uh, when those uh, uh, issues pop up in uh, portfolio performance in the near term. Number, and this uh, gets talked about tremendously, as it should, which is understanding fees and investment expenses. I think the Department of Labor uh, through 404A5, 408B2, additional disclosures, documentation, uh, frontline publications, um, Wall Street Journal publications have all talked about the impact of fees on investment expenses. And there is no question that the correlation between fees and performance is extremely high. Uh, and in using target date products where you would expect participants to have these allocations for protracted periods of time, High fees have a significant impact on the cumulative effect of wealth accumulation. Um, our trade-offs in the target date funds. Um, so when you get target date allocations, you know, it's important to certainly understand that high equity exposure does lead to uh, higher costs, uh, but you also expect that to get long to higher returns for that asset allocation. 
uh, clearly the time you begin using more esoteric asset classes. So when you get into those real return hedges that I mentioned earlier, um, or you get into some of the uh, standard diversifiers, all of those things do tend to increase the cost, uh, but may also increase benefits to participants if used selectively and judiciously. Uh, and earlier comment, actively managed products are more expensive than passively managed products. Um, and there is a great misunderstanding about how people should measure their fees. I think that uh, when we look at many investment reports, they tend to do is compare the cost of your investment product versus the variety of similar investment products that are available in the marketplace. And this on the right shows just that, the average target date and investment expense um, for uh, uh, the, all the actively managed products and passively managed products in the marketplace today. It breaks it into quartiles, lowest quartile, second, third, and fourth as it's stacked in the gray chart there. What this would say is roughly, uh, in compared on most investment reports, what it would say is that the average target date expense is roughly 0.9%. And that's true. There's half the investment products that carry uh, an expense ratio higher than that. Uh, but in an institutional setting, um, we think it's always important to take a look at the weighted cost or the usage weighted cost because it tends to dramatically skew the data. So when you look at the dollar weighted cost of investment, the usage weighted cost of investment, the average retirement plan or the average participant in a retirement plan actually is about 0.57% because the products in that top quartile, you know, 125 to 150 in total expenses are significantly less utilized by plans and by participants than the less expensive alternatives in the marketplace today. I do want to spend some time on the Department of Labor's comments on proprietary versus open architecture investment, because I do think that, that uh, much of what the analytic process would like plan sponsors to do is give very careful consideration to this issue. So I'm going to cover it in two different ways, one of which, and, and one that the Department of Labor seems very concerned with, is a very high level of correlation between the record-keeping service provider and the target data investment product that's being utilized by the plan sponsor. For instance, I use Record Keeper X. Record Keeper X has its own set of target date funds. And the correlation between those two items tends to be very, very high. Uh, and the department seems to be concerned, and I would uh, believe probably rightfully so, uh, that perhaps there's a quid pro quo that says if we go with record key X, we need to use investment product Y, and that as a result, participants aren't getting the level of customization and performance uh, that they might expect or that the Department of Labor might want to see. Um, and I think that there is clear evidence to support that that is, has been the practice, at least in the early stages of target date development. Um, I will also say that record keepers have become significantly more flexible in their ability to utilize uh, invent products in the target date realm uh, that are proprietary. So similar to other investment mandates where we've seen a transition from uh, high correlation between proprietary investment product and record keeper to lower levels of utilization, I think the same is happening in the target date investment universe. But I think it is important for committees to document if they're using a target date set that's proprietary, make sure that that they've gone through all of the prior steps that I've outlined to document why that's the correct decision uh, for their investment committee uh, and their participant population. Proprietary investment management side, which does tend to be uh, the overwhelming majority, at least currently, of target date structures, all of the underlying building blocks of the target date fund are managed by one investment manager management company. Not the same manager or managers, but that investment company is the one selecting the investment products among their stable of products. Uh, and there is the concern that it creates these perceived conflicts between the investors and the fund manager, uh, where uh, the only products available are the products within, again, that stable, uh, and perhaps they have the best international smart 
small cap exposure, the best real estate exposure, and as a result, participants do not perform as well. Architecture investment structure it goes a different way. It's not very common, uh, at least in the early days. We haven't seen huge utilization, but in this case, the target date fund manager utilizes portfolio managers from a number of different investment management environments. Uh, they utilize an open architecture structure, which is more similar to the types of investment structures that defined contribution plans have been using for some time. Often bundle these up through collective investment trusts rather than as individual investment products. However, that level of customization does tend to add fees. So there's this trade-off as to whether the flexibility of open architecture uh, can be uh, perched at a rate that's really reasonable given the constructs and the regulatory requirements that are there. There are some hybrid portfolios, sub-advised portfolios, where a proprietary manager may have uh, the majority of the investment mandate, uh, but where they may go out and select individual investment pieces to help build that entire portfolio together. And there is this trade-off between bundled and custom. The, certainly the Department of Labor some sponsors should review where having a a custom target date is a better solution. Uh, and there's some evidence that at least at the highest end of the market that that transition has begun to take place. Uh, 2010, P&I recorded that 26% of the target date investment universe uh, was custom. 50% uh, of companies in the Dow Jones Industrials now use and offer custom target date funds, according to Morningstar. Um, as I think I outlined a little earlier, the greater investment control and the ability to come up with a, a, a glock path that is suited specifically to your population um, clearly at least creates the opportunity for a greater level of customization. However, the cons are, can be very significant as well, and I think that's why you're seeing it in the larger end of the mar market uh, and certainly we utilize much less f frequently in the lower end of the market. Uh, there's a fair amount of time that goes into coming up and developing and then monitoring a glide path uh, and making changes to it. Uh, I think that as always there are higher investment product costs associated with customization than there are with buying products that are available in the marketplace as a whole. Uh, and thus are augmented by the fact that you still need to provide all the same regulatory disclosures for your custom product than you would with product off the shelf. Do you think that there's a potential conflict about investment monitoring versus investment product development? Uh, monitoring your target date investment structures the same way you're monitoring your other investment products. Um, if you have your consultant building products and monitoring the products they build, uh, certainly that can create a perceived conflict, a uh, real conflict in, in uh, how portfolios are managed and put together. Number then has to do with the target date retirement fund disclosures. Uh, FINRA has been concerned, certainly the Department of Labor as it relates to uh, qualified default investment alternative disclosure structures, um, talked repeatedly about making sure that participants understand uh, target date funds aren't magic. They don't make guarantees about your success in any investment strategy and that utilization should come with some level of understanding of the risk. Back in 2010, the EBSA from the Department of Labor proposed a rule designed to help participants better understand these structures. While still proposed, uh, I think that they do provide good guidance about perhaps the best practice as it relates to providing information to plan participants. The first piece of that was really a narrative explanation as to the target date asset allocation, how it changes over time, and when it gets to its most conservative approach. Uh, back again in 2008, 2007, 2009, uh, the period of time of heavy market volatility, the huge concern uh, that people who uh, had an expectation that they were going to or wanted to retire in 2008 may not have been aware how much equity exposure they still had at that point in time. Many having thought that they had no equity exposure given their nearness to retirement. And I think the way to do that certainly is through graphical illustrations. Here I've uh, shared one that I think uh, is, is strong that uh, 
uh, almost all providers provide, but shows that transition from early worker, high equity exposure to retiree, less equity exposure, and shows at least the underlying asset allocation that makes up the target date. And certain sort of description that target dates refer to a particular date and how they should be utilized. And the relevance of that date, the relevance of that date is not that if you make it to retirement, uh, you have uh, whatever you have, a pot of money uh, is or is not enough to retire on, but that you continue to, if you utilize that, that product on an ongoing basis, ex yourself in every, every case to some level of investment risk, be it interest rate risk, equity market risk, uh, infant risk, longevity risk. The, the risks are plentiful, uh, but helping participants understand that these products don't make those risks go away. They just provide some level of management to some of those risk objectives. Uh, seven, uh, utilizing the available information that's out there, which I thought was a strange set of guidance from the Department of Labor, because the reality is that the level of guidance out there is, is relatively anemic. Uh, Department of Labor and, and I think the SEC and FINRA certainly have, have, have taken steps to try and provide at least the most basic information. And the Department of Labor um, has provided investor bulletins. Certainly their work on 401k fees has been ongoing for a number of years. Uh, their documentation on fiduciary responsibilities uh, as well as selecting and monitoring uh, pension consultants I think is all, all valuable information and, and probably a must read. Uh, for members of uh, uh, retirement committees that are subject to the Employer Retirement Income Security Act. Uh, the SEC uh, certainly has their own set of pieces uh, related to investment fees and expenses, uh, asset allocation, diversification, rebalancing, and the impact of that on performance. And even FINRA has a tool called Fund Analyzer that helps you get a better feel for what's under the hood in some cases. Uh, but I think even that set, if you were to read through all 10 items that I've outlined, probably would be difficult to get fundamental understanding then of the investment product without working specifically with either the investment product provider uh, or your own consultants and fiduciaries to come up with uh, better documentation about your analytic process. And, and, and as is probably always the case related to uh, retirement plan fiduciary governance issues is, is documenting your process. Uh, it astonishes me how frequently we see investment policy statements um, that for plans that utilize target date funds heavily uh, don't spout the methodology by which they select and monitor target date funds. Again, uh, as we continue to see escalated growth in this area, uh, the documentation needs to be augmented, and, and, and frankly, the process needs to be improved in many cases so that the types of outcomes that you're seeking can reasonably be achieved. Um, a target date review process uh, that addresses these nuances, I think, again, is critically important. We see frequently uh, investment analytic books that compare your 2015 fund to other 2015 funds using arbitrary benchmark uh, that is not custom to the method and manner by which your target date fund is being uh, is being run. And I think that actually that type of data can be as, as distinctive as beneficial in making decisions about your process. Performance does dramatic directly vary from what you would expect. I do think you need to understand the cause of the variance. Uh, there's articles written about specific you know, fund managers who have underperformed over X, Y, Z period of time, uh, and often when you get under the hood and examine why the underperformance occurred, it's not because the target fund manager didn't execute well or do what they should have done or what we would have expected to do, but instead as a byproduct of the glide path. And to the extent that the glide path was selected and understood by the committee, um, it's important to understand the variance from others and, and be willing to accept it with the longer-term view of the benefits of the glide path that you've outlined. Certainly regularly whether those demographic changes 
in workforce impact glide path assumptions. Um, you know, there was when the uh, QDIA, the Qualified Default Investment Alternative uh, uh, came out, they provided employers the benefit of using a balanced fund, a single risk allocation balanced fund as a QDIA, as long as on an annual basis. Uh, they documented changes to the demographics in their workforce and reaffirmed that the specific balanced fund that they were utilizing was a good match to their population. And I think that from a best practice perspective, it's wise for target date, the, the, util, the, util, the, the user of target date fund glide paths to do the same thing, which is we elected this glide path for these reasons. Uh, we experienced any huge changes in demographics, therefore the glide path still is a good match to our client needs. Uh, I think that that guidance from the QDIA regulations fits very, very well in documenting the process of your glide path on the target date side. Evaluate any changes to the glide path and sub-advisors for ongoing suitability. I mentioned while uh, they have significant levels of continuity related to the the investment products you utilize, those investment products have gone through huge changes in the last three to four years in glide path, all of which I think needs to be documented, discussed, reviewed, approved. And anytime there's changes to the underlying building blocks, I think those also need to be evaluated. So when Lab Growth Manager X is replaced with Y, does that continue to meet our objectives going forward? Numbers to document the disclosures made to participants, whether it's QDIA disclosure, uh, your uh, 405 disclosures, and other disclosures you make to help participants be better informed, uh, help demonstrate your understanding of your obligations as a fiduciary. And then exact participant utilization. Are participants using the products correctly? And as a result of that utilization analysis, are there gaps that you can enhance through better uh, employee communication. So with that, I'm going to uh, open it up for some questions. Uh, I would uh, invite you to submit those to the uh, Q&A dialog box there to the right. Uh, again, I thank you for your attendance in today's presentation. A couple of housekeeping items, uh, the first of which is that a copy of this presentation uh, will be sent out to the attendees in the next couple of days, certainly before the holidays. So you can have a copy for your own fiduciary, uh, uh, your own fiduciary records. I think certainly time that you go through education like this, documenting it is a is a best practice. Uh, and then secondarily, if you have a need to see the presentation again, we have recorded it, uh, and we'll make it available uh, on our website uh, again before the holidays. I'm talking about using the funds correctly, which I think kind of ties to uh, this last uh, uh, slide presentation, or pardon me, this last um, uh, this last document, the process number seven. Uh, updates on uh, target funds side. When we say utilize the funds correctly, where we traditionally have concerns is where we see utilization of multiple target date funds and specific participant instances. So we have a, uh, a 45-year-old who's using the 2020, they've got 15% in the 2040, 10% in the 2030, and 5% in the 2050, and the remainder in a, in a brokerage window. These products have in all cases been to be single investment product solutions. Um, so when we see that there are participants using multiple target date products, that tends to be a concern. Uh, we have less concern when we see participants using a chunk of target date and then to maybe doing things on the outside as uh, the opportunity to try and enhance their own returns or do different things the target date fund may be utilizing. But probably the biggest one is either A, uh, using multiple target date funds, or B, using target date funds that are so dramatically different than their expected retirement age that it would call into question whether they understand the utilization process. Second question, uh, if it's a fund of funds, do the fees reflect the cost of the underlying funds as well? In almost all cases, uh, the in 
event expenses as reported include the underlying cost of the uh, funds available that make up the building block. So uh, in all the largest fund companies, when you see an expense ratio, it's really the weighted cost of the pieces that went into building the product. When products were first launched, there was a practice, a, a very common practice, of uh, a target date fund expense that may have been de minimis in nature, 10, 15, 20 basis points, but was additional to the underlying building blocks. I think that much of the 404A5 work that's out there um, has really alleviated and removed that process. Uh, and I think the, the only time that you would likely see products that didn't include in their weighted expense the cost of the underlying holdings might be uh, on the variable annuity side where there are some differences in how occasionally fees and expenses are reported. So I'll give one last second for additional questions. Again, I appreciate your attendance. Uh, if you have any questions that pop up, please do feel free to contact us. I'm always happy um, online to try and answer any questions and resolve uh, any clarifications that popped up during today's presentation. So again, thank you for your time, uh, and we look forward to speaking with all of you soon.